Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game, Rules by Chaosium. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try hard to stick to reasonable languages for all ages, listeners should know that this is a podcast that may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., may bear resemblance to persons living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. All right, welcome back uh, to the Old Ways Actual Play Podcast. I am Keeper Michael. I will be your keeper this evening, as the introduction mentions. Uh, We have a whole host of things to get to tonight. We have a wonderful show planned out for you. We need to get past introductions first, so to my right... This is Lonnie. I'm playing uh, Lawrence Edward Oliver Forsyth, who is very tired. <laughs> yeah, no, well, uh, he was when we last saw yeah. uh, Mr. Forsyth. He was also... No, uh, he's still very tired. He was harboring two women who might be on the run from an abusive husband. Th- that's my secret, Captain. I'm always tired. Right. <laughs> uh, to his right... Good evening, everyone. It is, I'm Heather, and I am playing Anastasia Edwina Fairchild, uh, known as Stasi, to her friends. Uh, she, when we last left her, she was bewildered, confused, angry, upset, scared as all hell, and has somehow activated this little stone that has been given to her through a pure feat of concentration. Time will tell what the consequences of that are. Uh, at the end of the table. I'm Jake. I'm playing uh, private investigator Jack Doyle, and I am currently... Well, just trying to uh, catch up on everything I seem to be getting dragged into. You are a man of many things to do. Your list seems to kind of grow and shrink. Growing and growing. Right. And as soon as you get something off of that list, two more things get put on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's good. It means you're always going to be working, right? Right. To my left there at the end of the day. This is James. I'll be playing Dr. Sigmund von Tartenbach, the group physician and... Uh, apparently, uh, border. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> seeming landlord. <laughs> to, Absolutely uh, to the group Absolutely. so far. You are you are an emergency you're, home. But the doctor's a pillar of the community. He cannot That's help. True. But help other people. That's who which he will is. someday be his downfall. That's absolutely uh, true. And then, uh, last but most certainly not least, uh, Tiffany and I am playing Maeve O'Shea, who can't go home. And why not? Actually. Somebody is looking for her and her stuff. Yes, it's very rather strange. Your uh, your house got completely ransacked, got broken into. They even left you a very loving note to say that they would be back some other time. It was akin to um, if I if a page would have shown up and handed me a piece of paper with a black hand on it. Um, maybe, but that didn't happen. Thank God. <laughs> so we're gonna lift the curtain. On Sunday morning church services. So we have mem- many members of the attending religious folk here. We have many who do not. But I'm going to start tonight with Mr. Doyle. You go to church as is your common practice on Sundays. Yes. You meet my family there. And- mm-hmm. You meet your family. Uh, the church. It's the first Sunday in April, and so the church is very packed with uh, not only your family, but all sorts of other families as well. Uh, The service is relatively straightforward. Um, the, the, The sermon for the most part today is a lesson uh, amongst the parables of the Bible where they discuss in rather specific detail about a man who goes out from his father to take up his own life and begin building wealth and riches. And when he completely strikes out on his own, he returns to his father, not shunned as his brother's demand that his father shun, but he returns and and his father 
heaps offerings upon him, new robes, gold rings, a clean bath. And the sermon's underlying message to the faithful here in the pews today is that all God's children should seek to hold up those of less fortune. And even in these times when some of the community are doing well, there are those within our very church body here that could use some of the compassion that Christ showed. It's not the sermon that stirs you so much. What stirs you so much really is the gentleman about 30 feet from you to the left that for the most of the most of the sermon can't take his eyes off of you. Well-dressed man, dark suit, takes his hat off in church so at least you know he has some level of respect. But that is a man that you saw at a deli not but a couple of days ago. You being here with your family, it would be I'd be lying if I told you that Mr. Doyle might not be at least a little uncomfortable with the entire affair. Right. Church recesses, and much as you always do, the family walks out the front of the church to say goodbye to the father and the rest of the priesthood. Um, did that gentleman come out? He does. Um, okay, I'll tell my family. Uh, I'll meet you back at the house. There's something i got to take care of real quick. Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, no problem. You step away from the family. You see that another couple of gentlemen have joined this man that you saw at the deli. The man you saw at the deli, this is the, the one that was the last one to speak. The, um... What you're boss. assuming is the boss. Yeah. I haven't seen you gentlemen here before. No, Mr. Doyle, this isn't my church. No, you see it out a little bit. I wanted to extend to you an offer. We'd like to discuss a few things. Yeah, Absolutely. Do you have a moment? Yeah. He steps away from the church steps and you kind of walk down the to the front of the church where there's a long line of park sedans. Now, not every parishioner here at the church has got a car, mm. but there are a fair amount of them. The ground is still a little bit wet from last night's thunderstorm. But you curve around the eastern side of the block until you get to a very, uh, well, a very new looking black four-door sedan. They, uh, the two gentlemen that come with him, one stops behind the car, one goes around to the driver's side. You're not going to open it for me? I think you know how to use a door handle. Fair enough. You hop inside. Inside, the boss of the deli and then his associate take their seats. And then the engine cranks up. And you are swiftly down the street. I spoke with Mr. Torrio on your behalf. There's a problem. A problem? This woman. Oh, so you know about the woman. Of course we know about the woman. We'd like you to pick her up. Pick her up? Yeah. I see. Miss Torio would like you to remove her from the situation. He's not worried about um, his associate? Miss Daltieri can make whatever assumptions he likes. It's out of his hands. Is there a particular uh, time, place, or method they want used? 
<laughs> Much like you, Mr. Altieri is a religious man. Except that he takes his religious experiences on the north side of town, usually till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an address. Okay. Provided, provided you can get over there in a reasonable amount of time, you might be able to collect the lady. But um, Miss Toria does have one request. Yes. She doesn't leave with any of the finery. You understand? Of course. The things that have been heaped on her? Right. Yeah. This doesn't seem like to be a big problem. Good. Mr. Torrey would appreciate it if you kept this business between us. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Doyle. The car stops. Like, it pulls off to the side of the road. And uh, he reaches over and opens the door. Thank you very much. The door shuts and the car speeds away. Mr. Forsyth? Mr. Forsyth. You are a religious man. I am. And you go to church. I do. To be specific, I go to the First United Methodist Church. You do. You do. Um, The service today, for the most part, is relatively straightforward. Um, There's a whole lot less of the stand-up, sit-down, fight, fight, fight that the Catholic Church does here. No. So, the nice part about church for you is it's not only a social event, obviously, you get to see friends that you know that go every week, but it's a lot less of a cut into your direct time because it's not as necessary to spend four and a half hours at church every Sunday. There's Yeah, there's none of the frippery of the idolaters. It's absolutely... <laughs> and that's helpful. Post-church, are you heading back to your house? Um... Probably because I'm very tired. You are exhausted. I, I, it has been a long and trying couple of days. <clears throat> uh, many upsetting things have happened. Oh, yes. Uh, and to be honest, I was probably trying not to fall asleep desperately through the sermon. <laughs> um, I've been there. So, yeah, normally on a Sunday, I would probably um, go home anyways because there's not much open, not much doing on a Sunday. You know, most places are pretty well shuttered on a even, Sunday. Even the order is not in their halls on Sunday, so there's no point in being there. So You head home to yeah. find a couple of relatively, probably peacefully sleeping guests at your house still. That's, I'm, going to, I'm going to bed. I'm going to lock the front door first. Miss Fairchild, you wake to hear the front door being locked. It snaps you awake. Yes. I... Probably hold my breath until I, as I listen. Um, you hear somebody walk through the main room and then towards the back of the house and then probably back towards the front room. Yep. And then you hear the kind of soft creak, maybe, of a couch or couch springs. Yep. My hand would probably uh, would automatically go to the straight razor that's <laughs> properly uh, under my pillow now right. you know why I carry and, a gun everywhere <laughs> right. Very and uh, yeah I don't think she's going to let this go for a while right. and uh, I will very cautiously step out of bed and peek yeah. and the door see a sleep, you see a sleepy eyed Forsyth kind of leaning his head back onto the couch cushion. Yep. I He's still in his church clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I let out a. I think I finally breathe again. Okay. Go back, curl back up into bed next to Mary. Okay. It's just hand still under the, under the pillow with. The straight razor. And she just stirs a little, but stays asleep. I'll just kind of snuggle ne- in next to her and try to to rest a little bit. If there's any day that you prefer, Mister Tottenbach, Doctor Tottenbach, mm. 
It has to be Sunday, only because, in general, you've caught back up with everything from the week. It is a time, especially as uh, someone who is from Germany originally, Sundays are usually days at the park or days spent with family. Quiet reflection, rest. Yeah. Um, You have a house guest, which is odd for you. But I, I make breakfast. Yeah. I have not made hotcakes in many years. You make breakfast. Mr. Shea, you wake up to the smell of food cooking. It's strange at first, because since you live as a solitary uh, person, you normally have to cook your own breakfast, uh, but you smell food. Yeah. Hotcakes, probably uh, some type of sausage or bacon, and uh, any coffee, I would imagine. Yep, singing a German tune and uh, puttering around the tiny kitchen. Um, I will uh, get dressed and head downstairs. Okay. Yeah, you head downstairs. Um, yeah, there's the doctor. Guten Morgen, Liebchen. Breakfast will be done quite soon. Please. Okay. I'm excited. (laughs) Are you excited for a man's cooking? Well, (laughs) considering I don't really cook. I'm a bachelor. (laughs) I gotta learn to cook or starve, so it's gonna be too terrible. Or really (laughs) has to like bail you out and make something. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Make us both a nice heaping plate of flapjacks and flapjacks and a rasher of bacon. Okay. Yeah, you collect uh, the ingredients and make a reasonably decent breakfast as the two of you kind of commiserate over coffee and a uh, you know, rather long night. Please, dig it. <coughs> Don't Thank make you. Me, do not make me eat this entire, entire breakfast myself. Although I feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Indeed. You seem as though you've already had more than enough trouble for the last few days. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta go get those books and things. Of course, but first, you must finish your flapjacks. Yes. Your plan for the day is to return to your house and then collect the important things? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, my uh, research and books and things, so I can continue finding the trail of my father, and then, yeah. Mm, yes, the trail of your father. And then I gotta finish researching that book, too. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is redline that part of tonight, and just say that you go to your house, you collect a fair amount of things, so what I'd like you to do is just make a list of, say, the five biggest categories of things you're gonna take away. Assume that you have, um, at least suitcases that can fit most of the stuff. Obviously, you won't be able to pack the entire house. Right. Um, And then my question to you is, are you alerting anybody that you had a break-in? Um... Yeah, I guess I'll uh, contact the police. Okay. You contact the police and let them know that you had a break-in. They ask uh, basically the five W's of you know who, what, where, when, etc. And then they tell you that they they're going to send an officer by to take a look at the house. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you're there with her doctor helping mm-hmm. her collect her stuff. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, the police officers. The police officer comes by, walks up, uh, and takes a basically some pertinent information as far as. Uh, you know, get an idea of what happened here. When did it happen? Uh, he doesn't seem. He seems a bit distracted. Okay. <laughs> Even the two of you notice as he kind of wanders through the house. He seems a little distracted. Hmm. Keeping a close eye on him. Like a closer eye on him. Yeah, he walks with you through the house, first floor, um, the upstairs as well. Mm-hmm. And then. Yeah. Give me a psychology roll. 
even have that. Some people do. Actually, everyone should have a little bit of a base. Yeah. 46 under a 48. Doctor, nope. you notice something telling about his overall body language. Mm -hmm. When he goes into the second floor with her, because you're right behind Mm -hmm. her, he does not flinch before entering her bedroom. He steps right in as if it's commonplace. Make sure I have my cane on me. Yeah, you probably yeah. needed to walk up the stairs, yeah. but yeah. What did you say your name was, officer? My he turns around. Officer My, Cal. Officer Cal. Yes. Oh, good, good. I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Of course, and you are Doctor Tartenbach. Let's see. He starts scribbling in a hand notebook. I uh, stop at the doorway of the bedroom. Miss O'Shea, do you mind? No. (laughs) So, uh, anything stolen in here? I haven't been through anything, as you can tell. I don't know what is missing, what is not. A lot of fancy clothes. Yes, I, I perform. I'm a singer. Oh, yeah. Where at? Uh, several places. I don't have one specific place. She doesn't perform in one place for too long. You know, she's quite talented, so she goes all over the place. Wouldn't you say, Miss O'Shea? Yeah, I've been to a few yeah. places. <laughs> like, when he's examining the room, yeah. I, like, poke her in the ribs with the tip of my cane really quick. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> like, trying, trying to get her attention. Yeah, I and literally like throw her a leading look, like look at him, look at her, and like give her a very brief shake of the head. Sure. <laughs> the uh, officer walks back downstairs with you and says that he'll be here relatively just a few more minutes, walk around the external part of the property, and then. He'll write it up when he gets back to the precinct. Okay. And he steps outside and you know, goes to the window where you said that they entered in at, writes a few more notes. The two of you are still inside. Keeping an eye on him. Not getting very far from where he's at, even if I'm inside and he's outside. Yeah, he's I not s- paying a ton of attention to what he's doing. Perfect. To what he's doing? Yeah. Or to what I'm doing. Um, no, no, you get the. You have seen someone, whether it be in the medical practice or whether it be a trained practitioner of some mm-hmm. type of trade. You have seen someone what we would call nowadays go through the motions. Sure. And that is what he is. He's doing. phoning it in, basically. Oh, you bet. Okay. Well, since he's outside and the window's closed, mm-hmm. I assume yep. I do not trust this man, not even a little bit. I don't trust anybody. I mean, I specifically do not trust this man. You think he was one of them? I don't know, but I, the way he is working, the way he is going through the motions... I don't trust him at all, his reaction to going into your bedroom. And uh, he seems to want to know, I mean, he is a police officer, and they, of course, he's, if he's investigating, he will want to know things about you, but... Something tells me to not trust him. We have someone else to investigate. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe we can see if he goes... If he's on the outside by the window, maybe we can match his boot prints. That's an interesting theory. Go outside. While he's out there going through the motions. You go outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, He seems to be uh, checking the window frame, writing in his book. He's having a smoke. Look at the... Give a, a, a sniff to what he's... Uh, it's, what he's uh, burning. Prob- I mean, it's a cheap, cheap American, cheap American probably cheap tobacco. American cigarettes, yeah. Okay, cheap American tobacco. It's a lucky strike. Uh, also, compare the size of his boot prints to the ones on the ground. That's a spot hidden roll, and it's going to be hard. You got it. Uh, 
I made it, but not under a hard. Okay. It's a 37 under 54. Yeah, you'd have to spend quite a bit of luck to get down. That would be ten luck to get a lot. lot. Up up to you. You're welcome to spend it if you want. You know what? Screw it. Why not? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. All right. Spend ten luck. Yep. I'm gonna spend ten luck. Uh, You come out just in time as he's taking a look at the windowsill. Yep. And you see that he has, unfortunately, maybe for him. He has decided to step near the window where the boot mark, the boot prints were. Mm-hmm. You knew where they were because you'd seen them before with Mr. Doyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he presses his boot down and then turns back to you after he's done with his investigation, mm-hmm. you see that the the, pr- the the boot prints themselves are a near match. That's what I thought. Looks like they came in through here. I that's. I don't know. I am not good at investigations of such things. I am a doctor. We're used on the insides. Mm-hmm. Poke him in the ribs a little bit with my cane. Yeah, you know, it's hot. Works. Easy, Doc. <laughs> we'll get this down in the station, uh, Miss O'Shea. And this, if we hear anything, we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. We have had a couple of other break ins in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah? Yeah, over the past week or so. So keep your eyes peeled if you're uh, planning on staying. We should definitely start keeping it in the safe in your office then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we should. You folks have a nice day. Tips his hat to you. Kind of walks on <coughs> down the line. Well, I say it real <laughs> loud. Well, not real loud, but louder. Uh well, we better clean this up if we're going to stay. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Okay. You guys go back inside. Yeah. Mr. Doyle, yeah. you head across town. Yes. To a <coughs> fancy hotel that's downtown. You walk in a very busy, busy lobby area. Uh the veneer of prohibition lasts just about as long for you to get from the front door to the front desk. You see, your well-trained eye picks out a couple of different um, crystal bottles that are, uh, you know, surreptitiously tucked in specific areas. The man at the front desk asks... Can I help you, sir? Yes, uh, I have an appointment to speak with uh, Miss Mallory. Oh. Okay. He goes into a book. Looks like that's uh, floor 16. Two beat. I'll ring you up if you'd like. He goes to the... No, no, that's okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Alrighty. You head over to the elevators. It cranks up and then slowly drifts upward and through the building until you get to the 16th floor. I go to 2B. You walk down the hall and then take a right. And you see outside of 2B, you see two gentlemen standing outside the door. Almost flanking the doorway. Right. What'd you do? I walk up to the uh, two gentlemen. Can I help you, Mac? Yes. Uh, Mr. Torrio asked if I would take her out and uh, bring her to Mr. Um, Altieri. All right, I'm going to have you make a bluff roll. What? <laughs> what? That's not charm. <laughs> it's not bluffing if he thinks it's true. <laughs> okay, so which one is that? Fast talk. So fast, fast talk, talk, yeah. Ugh, of course it's fast talk. Well, that won't do it. Okay. No, sir. He uh, guy kind of screws up his features. 
Wait a minute, who are you? You don't know who I am? No, pal, I don't. I don't know why you're asking it for Mr. Altier's lady. Because I have to get her out of here before the feds show up. So you're going to double down? Yeah. On your, uh, <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> why not? Uh, so what I'll say is that's, that is probably more of a fast talk roll than a bluff. Or more than a yeah, fast talk, probably. So you're going to attempt to push your roll? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, shit, that's not going to work either. Okay. Can you spend some luck? No, it's not enough. All right. <laughs> uh, the guy... The guy in front of you steps back and puts his hand in his jacket. Listen, pal, why don't you move it on down the line before something bad happens to you? God damn it. Indeed. No, there's just, there's just nothing for it. I'm going to have to... Uh, Tell the truth. Tell the truth. <laughs> No, that's not going to help at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to drop, dude. Both okay. Well, that's not going to work very well. How are you planning on doing that? Not that one. <laughs> Just pull out all your weapons at once. <laughs> no, I'm not Forsyth. <laughs> There's my brass knuckles. You're getting a reputation, sir. <laughs> what are you getting? You know okay. what? So you like... Put your hands in your pocket mm-hmm. and grab for your brass knuckles. Yeah. Okay. Mr. So what is what is your dexterity? My dexterity is 60. Okay. Your dexterity is 60. So you will go first. So you'll go first and then right. one of them will attempt to get in action. Oh, damn. That is a five. Ooh. Hang on. Is that a... That's probably an extreme? Yeah, that's an extreme. Okay, so... Let's see here. Because I believe... It's okay, because we can edit this out later. Extreme! Well, it's not just that. It's, um... It could be in combat because it's an extreme success we might be able to rule it a knockout blow. That would be awesome. That would yeah. help a great deal, right? A one-hitter quitter, as we would call it here in the present. Yes. You betcha. We haven't had a whole lot of combat. Um, and that's probably a good thing. Either, right? <laughs> I can't wait to punch we, somebody with brass knuckles. We haven't had a lot of combat. Doyle <laughs> <laughs> has gotten more than his I'm a man of action. Right? <laughs> Man, a few words. Most I, of those words are punch, kick, shoot. I can't, I can't wait to punch somebody with brass knuckles because I can do a maximum of eight damage. Nice, <laughs> right? Helps having that constitution of eighty. Yeah, <laughs> my brass knuckles have okay. the word two so... three for on them. <laughs> I'm not terribly tough. <laughs> I'm not terribly tough. Well, I'm not. I'm not like you know hulking. No, I know. You think a pair of brass knuckles that just says DDS engraved on it. <laughs> DDS? Yes, because this puts holes in teeth. <laughs> That's terrible. No. Just so we're all aware, um, we Best. can't push, you cannot push a combat. Right, right. yeah, right. So, um, okay, so greater damage is inflicted if the attacker gains an extreme level of success in their attack. This only occurs if the attack is made in the character's turn in dex order, not when fighting back. So if you, the attacker, achieve an extreme success with a non-impaling weapon, a blunt weapon, etc., then they have hit a weak spot and caused maximum damage. So plus maximum any damage bonus to save. So if the attacker achieves an extreme level of success with a penetrating weapon, then an impale has been inflicted. Impales are different. We don't have to worry about that. So the way we resolve this with an extreme success is you tell me how much the maximum damage for the brass knuckles would do, and that's what gets applied. Okay. So it is... Okay, so it's five. Plus any damage bonus. Yeah, I don't have much. That's fine. Okay. 
So you reach back, uh, and he's actually going to try to dodge because he can't do that. But not with that roll. That's a 73. Uh, so you have the high level success, and uh, you give him a stout pounding in the face with a, a bare piece of metal attached to your hand. And he drops like a rock. At least for the moment. At least for the moment. Uh, but the additional person here in this locality, his other goon, is going to attempt to swing on you as well. Now, you can dodge or you can fight back. So if you fight back, the highest level of success wins. Right. Uh, or you can attempt a maneuver, but instead of inflicting damage, you would apply a different maneuver modifier. So what would you like to do? I am going to fight back. You're going to fight back. You try something new. It would be. You know, the worst part about this, I can't read these Cthulhu dice. Save my life. Yeah, the designs <laughs> on them are really not very useful. Yeah, <laughs> but they're cool dice. They're 25. Yeah, they're pretty, but the actual numbers need to be put yeah. in a different color or something. I can do you, that for you. I have dice. I have... Wait. Epoxy. That was 75. Yep. You inflict damage, so go ahead and roll damage. Oh, you see the incoming fist, you block Five. it, and then bang right back. Maximum damage. Five. Okay. You do another five. So you basically one, two punch both these goons in a kind of flurry of fists. And they're, for the moment anyways, on the floor with their mouths in their hands. I'm going to kick each one of them. Like, specifically for damage? Yeah, I'm going I'm to make sure they go down. Or, I mean, if I can kick them to knock them the hell out. Would you like to attempt to knock them out? Yes, I would like to attempt to knock them out. Is that a maneuver? Um, I can find out. I cast Fist. <laughs> no. No, no, no. no. Cast it's fist. Doyle Floating Fist. So, if you want to knock someone out... They're not completely unaware... So, I would like you to give me a successful kick roll. That is a successful kick roll. Okay, apply kick damage, because you are kicking them. What's kick damage? Is that just regular... uh, Yeah, it's unarmed damage. Okay. That would be four. Okay. Yeah, the first guy is definitely knocked out. And kick to the second. Kick to the head. Boot to the head. head. Oh, yeah, that's a hard. Okay, roll damage. That'll be five. Yeah, no, they're definitely knocked out. So you make pretty short work of these two gentlemen outside 2B. Okay, um, and then I will knock on the door. You knock on the door? Uh, you hear music playing. In the in the other side of the apartment door, you hear a lady's voice. One moment. Ah, damn! I should drag these guys off first. Oh well. The door unlocks, and you see a somewhat familiar woman you saw from a distance. She's probably five foot ten. She has shoulder a little longer than shoulder length brunette hair. Uh, she has relatively soft features, and she's wearing a fairly upscale and attractive house coat. So I'll step up enough that I'm kind of blocking the doorway. Sure. Oh, Miss Mallory, we need to get going. The uh, apparently the cops wouldn't know you're here. Who are you? I work for uh, Mr. Torrio. Torrio. Oh. Uh, um. Uh. Okay, go ahead and um, give me a fast talk roll. 
I really have to this work. One. I have to really work on my fast. Yeah, you need to succeed at this. One. I do actually, yeah, and cool. I get a hard. Check that. Check that <laughs> box. <laughs> Remember, we are checking boxes of successful skill rolls. It's really important. Yes, especially for the uh, later on part of the session. Uh, she scrambles. She begins scrambling, and she goes into uh, this is first of all, this is a wide ranging apartment, very opulent style, big crown molding pieces, uh, a full liquor bar to the right, all sorts of things to choose from. And she sweeps into the bedroom and then begins just just shoving things yeah. in the bag. Just just get dressed. We'll come back. We'll have somebody come back and get everything later. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just, just be right with you. All right. So I will drag those two goons mm-hmm. in and put them like behind a sofa or something. To just be- <laughs> <laughs> stack them like cordwood. <laughs> behind random furniture. <laughs> I just I'm gonna sweep her as soon as she gets dressed. I'm sweeping her out of here. I hope I just put a. So she well, she just, she just closed the, the bedroom doors right. that way. She yeah. can't be. I don't want her stumbling across these two uh, goons. Goons in the yeah. hallway. Okay, that'd be hard to describe. Okay. Um, um, you get them in a position where you think that she probably can't see them. She exits the bedroom door. <laughs> she does not see them, <laughs> and she heads towards you. Right. Like, I'm ready. All right, let's go. Uh, you hustle out of the apartment and then back to the elevator. And eventually down to the first floor, and she's she's kind of um, impatiently tapping her feet in the elevator. So where where are we going? We have. Uh, I'm going to take you to a train. We'll take you to a safe house. Oh wow! Like, Louis never said it was going to get like this. Well, you know, sometimes we have to uh, things get a little more heated than other times. Is he okay? Oh yeah, he's fine. We're just uh, protecting everybody who might be of uh, interest to, you know. Of course. The elevator lets out on the first floor. Where are you heading with her? Well, I don't want to go... I don't want to go through the main lobby. Okay. But I assume there's probably another way out. There are multiple entrances and exits, but, I mean... You've never been to this hotel before, so you don't know necessarily where they are. You'd have to begin kind of searching or making some assumptions. Yeah, well, I don't want to go past the front desk. Okay. So, I will... Ma- I will. You I pass will. by a dining room, you pass by a smoking lounge, and you eventually get let out into a, basically a porter's en- entrance on the side of the uh, hotel. All right. Get a cab. Okay, you flag a cab down. Take you to the train station. Okay, you're taking her to you. Well, I have to take her back to New York, yeah. so. She gets to the train station. You can see that she's uh, starting to look a little concerned when she gets to the train station. It's right outside of town. Okay, okay. Uh, so, what, am I going to end up in Indiana or something? Um, Just across the border into Indiana. Indiana. You ever been to Gary? No. Yeah, well, don't worry. Okay. You can get to the train station booth. Mm-hmm. You stand in line for a couple of minutes until you get to the... Stand right over there. I just... I'm sorry, I just... I figured you'd want to have a smoke before we go, right? Yeah, I suppose. You got a light? Of course I have a light. Can you light do the gentleman right. thing in? Get her position in a specific area. Two tickets to New York. Sure. The forty-seven fifty. Okay, I have to deduct that. But that's fine. You actually don't really have to worry about it unless it's outside. What's your credit rating? It's it's outside my credit rating, but no, I have that cash from. Oh right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the wad of money from the Swift's uh, office. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to expense it out. Right. Okay. You collect it. Collect the tickets. He says the train should be uh, leaving in about a half an hour. Okay. And I'll leave you there for a second. (laughs) Miss Fairchild, you wake up, and when you wake up, Mary is out of bed. There is a... 
few moments of panic. Is she in the room? Do I see her? No, you, she... you don't see her. She's okay. not in the room. Then there's definitely a few moments of panic. I will snap awake, grab my trusty <laughs> uh, straight, straight razor, razor yes. underneath from underneath the cover and uh, <clears throat> and just bolt out of bed to go look. I have to find her. Okay. Uh, she seems to be sitting in the front room. Mr. Fordyce is still asleep. And she's reading National Geographic. <laughs> I rushed to her. Oh, you're awake. <sighs> you should have woken me. You looked tired and I was bored. <sighs> um, question for you, Mr. Forsyth. When you were uh, staying awake last night with your gun out, which gun inspector was that? Oh, uh, the thirty-eight revolver. <laughs> Okay. Would you have continued that sort of century type position? Um, not when I um when I went to bed, no. Okay. <clears throat> the gun would probably be lying on the table. To be she, honest. Um, Mary looks at you and closes the National Geographic with her right hand, and kind of places it on the table. It's okay. She reaches with her left hand up from the side of the Barker lounger, the lounger that she's in, the chair that she's in, and she places a thirty-eight revolver on the table. I think my when my eyebrows goes off, I'm like, no, yes, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> yes, you are. Although. Hell for just a bit of hair of the dog. Now that you've slept, maybe you can tell me what happened. I need coffee. I need coffee. answers. That's what I need. I need to know who's been living with me. <clears throat> coffee first, and then we'll talk. I can't at least have a decent drink in my hand. At least I could have some, a cup of joe. I think there's still some left over from last night anyway. The night before. There is. It's quite cold. <laughs> yeah, but you got a stove and like, coffee will yeah. heat right back up. That's the nice thing about coffee. <laughs> cold and cold. <clears throat> you heat up some coffee. Uh, you come out of your nap soon afterwards. Uh, you see that your What you wake up to, Mr. Forsyth, as you open your eyelids is uh, the position of your pistol has changed on the table. There's nobody in the room with you at this point, but you do hear voices in the kitchen. Uh, I go collect the pistol and check it and make sure it's still loaded. It sure is. No, And no shots have been fired from it? No, sir. I might have slept through that. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. I uh, put it back in my pocket mm -hmm. where it sits. Because I don't know if I have a holster for it, like like you know, fancy people do, or detectives, or what have you. What's so fancy about a holster? Right. Uh, they weren't exactly <laughs> the thing that people of the day had. Okay. I mean, not 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 city people. Can we pause for just a second. I really. Um. Yeah. I I re recover the pistol, put it back in my pocket. I hear noises probably from the kitchen. You do. I uh, wander in there. Um, okay. Well, I wander into the doorway. I probably see them earnestly talking. You do? And I turn around and I walk right back out because this is none of my business. I think this is probably also something where Mr. Forsythe probably doesn't want to know what's going on. Exactly, doing. yes. It's very, it's very reasonable to say that you might not want to know. Uh, absolutely, I don't. Okay. So, um, yeah, I will just, um, I honestly don't know what to do with myself right now. Um, I'm just going to go in and maybe turn on the radio. Okay. You go in and turn on the radio. It definitely covers up the voices from the kitchen. And, uh, Miss Fairchild, you and Mary have a 
probably a fairly frank conversation about life. And I guess what I want to know is, Mm -hmm. what all are you sharing with her? What are you telling her in, in kind of summation? I would give her, (laughs) I suppose, the brief overview, yet sad tale of one Agnes, (laughs) Agnesia Rose Christophowitz. A child born from horrors on the other side of the world, Mm -hmm. who found herself shuttled off to America by a combination of pure chance and determination by a mother who would not give up. Who found themselves in Milwaukee, in a small, poor, run-down part of town near the breweries, and who at a young age thought she found a way out through the handsome and well-to-do son of a head brewer. But the dream quickly turned into a nightmare. Hmm. Interesting. You find your discussions with her very intimate, but yet you convey the idea and seem to, with almost an astonishment to yourself, smooth over her rough edges. She accepts much of what you tell her as the truth, at least seemingly. And she really just comes down on feeling like she had been lied to. She understands why now, but it's, she tells you it's going to take her time to absorb what it means for her. It, sometimes it will take time. I thought that part of my life was gone forever. I thought I had left her completely behind. I tried everything to make sure she never existed again. We can only run from what we fear for so long. I wish it was just a question of fear. Besides, you do know me. You know me, the real, true me. Whether a different name or a different place, but it's still, this is who I am. She seems, probably by 20 or so minutes into it, she seems relatively convinced of that. Like, I, I get up at, at that point. I go into the room and I come back mm-hmm. with the book that I had grabbed from the table, from the drawer in yeah. the other house. And I pull out a very worn folded piece of paper and I hand it to her. Okay. On seeing the conversation move into the living room, I suddenly remember that the Sunday paper is outside and I should collect it. <laughs> Fair enough. You, uh, I just remembered I need to be somewhere not here. 
You, uh, yeah, I think I left the, um, yeah, on. <laughs> yes, yes, I left the meter running. Yeah. Um, you step outside for the Sunday paper. Yes. The piece of paper is, she opens it, she'll read the letter that Agnes's mom right. gave her. Okay. Yeah, it's a very emotional moment for the two of you. Miss O'Shea, doctor? Yeah. Tell me how you're feeling the rest of your Sunday. Probably now, at least turning right the furniture and stuff so it looks like we're going to stay here. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm collecting the things I need to take to his place. Sure. Help her, help her clean up a few of her things while she's collecting stuff and then... While she takes a few more minutes, I grab an interesting looking book and take a few take a few minutes to read some stuff that she's got laying around. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's rather heady oh, material. Sure. sure. Um, it is not impossible for your learned brain to grasp some of the concepts, although it does not it doesn't feel as much of a science as you were hoping it would mm. feel like. It feels more Almost like a religious text, mm -hmm. and that seems a little too fluid for your. I like a little more cut and dried. Well, you like things that can be substantiated, exactly, and that is very difficult. Yeah, I cannot see he uh, taste these things. I hope I can taste them. <laughs> After your most more recent investigations, you are hoping you cannot taste them. Yeah. <laughs> You spend an hour or two riding the ship, as it were. And actually, between last night and, and tonight, I mean, yes, does some stuff need to be swept up? Sure. Does some other stuff need to be repaired or replaced? Absolutely. But the house is in relatively working order. Yeah, I just, you know, want it to look like I'm going to be staying here, even though I'm not staying here. Make okay. sure I lock everything up and head out. So what I'd like to do is get an idea of... You're heading out to back to the doctor's office, yes. right? So, uh, I will pause you there just temporarily, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Doyle. Uh, Mr. Doyle, your train arrives. You and her get on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the conductor punches your tickets, and you step on the train, and you get into the you know, lounge cars, etc., and then the train gets moving. When it doesn't stop in Indiana, she begins to get concerned. Yeah, I'm sure she does. <laughs> what are you it's doing? Understandable. Are you saying anything to her? Are you communicating with her at all, or are you just going to let it ride? I would see how long I can let it ride before I have okay. to, uh... She, after about five or ten minutes past the Indiana stop, looks at you and says, I thought you said this was just over the border. Yeah. Did she... This doesn't make any sense. We're going a real far way across the border. The border was 20 minutes ago. Well, you know, it, it seems a little farther than it is. What's going on here? Well, um, Mrs. Huntington, we're she going back a, to New York. She raises an eyebrow immediately and tries to stand up. No, no. Sit down. Are you going to attempt to um, socially accost her in any way? Yeah. Or physically prevent her from standing up? No, I, I mean, sit down. She uh, she I'm lingers a, she lingers a bit. I'm going to use intimidate. You're going to intimidate her. Okay. Huh? This I can do. <laughs> <laughs> this I know how to do. Uh, this would be a hard intimidate. She looks genuinely spooked. It kind of eases herself back down to the seat. How do you know that name? 
Well, your uh, former in-laws hired me to find you. You gotta be kidding me. You can't run far from people with money. I tell you, you don't know these rich types like I do. I don't. I bet they're paying you a pretty penny to let bring me all the way back to New York. They are indeed. She seems to mope for a good couple minutes. I gotta tell you, Louis gonna be real mad I'm gone. Yeah, he probably will. Though, um, if he talks to his boss, I'm sure everything will get smoothed out. Hmm. So Torio was the one that gave it up. Well, you know, he doesn't like people draw, um, drawing attention to himself. You throw one party, and everything is out of whack. She flops back into the seat. When you arrive in New York a day or so later... You make a call, and you meet an intermediary, we'll put it like that, who helps assist Elise into the back of a sedan, and shakes your hand with a manila envelope. It was nice doing business with you. We appreciate your attention to detail. Hopefully she wasn't too much of a trouble. No. No, it was easier than I thought. Hmm. I just got shot at a couple times, that's all. (laughs) Well, I'm sure a man in your line of work, that's pretty much par for the course. Basically, yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Doyle. We'll reach out if uh, we have anything in the future. And if you're ever in New York, look us up. I don't know. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to give you each about five or ten minutes to tell me what you are going to do with a year of time on your hands. So currently it is April 1st, 1923. When we reconvene, it will be more than a year later. So say about 14 months. It will be roughly the beginning of August. 1924. So, what would Miss O'Shea do with more than 12 months' time? Um, well, uh, she would eventually go back home. Okay. Um, I move her stuff back home. Sure. Um, probably install more security on her office. In what way? Um, blocks, bolts, you know, anything sure. she can, you know. Physical door locks? Right. Because the other stuff, you know, she thinks she can replace. That stuff, she doesn't want to have to try. Sure. Um, the other thing is, is she's definitely going to visit her mother. In Arkham? Sure. Yeah. Several times and mm-hmm. uh, finish researching the book. Yeah, absolutely. So... Upon finishing the book, the book actually takes her maybe the better part of another couple of weeks to finish up when she actually has her brain attached. Um, so you do um, need to make me a, um, I believe it's a, Eddie roll. I will double check here. I think it might be your Eddie roll. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Hang with me. I know it's late. That's my back. Um, you need to make a language roll. D100. No, I'm over by eight. Would you like to spend any luck to make that roll? Considering you're writing a book. I would. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I mean, you can't lose Sampy. Don't push your luck on this. (laughs) You ever read a James Michener book? (laughs) Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> you read, any, read anything by James Minchner? No. No, don't. I don't. Look, okay, man, I'm a guy who's survived multiple Air Von Daniken books. Mm. I'm fine. I, we apologize to any fans of James Minchner. It's okay, it'll, it'll get cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, leave that in there for no context. Right. Okay, so <laughs> do you any fans of James Mitchner? Just here. general. Sorry. <laughs> you lose. Because there's always a loss. Oh, yes, there's always a loss. You lose four points of sanity. Yes! She's really going for that bottom. Um, you gain eight points of an occult skill, because there is actually occult knowledge in it as well. And you also gain six points of Cthulhu Mythos. Jesus. Now, keep in mind that your your overall peak sanity, your highest point of sanity, can, cannot be any higher Right, because of the mythos, or because of the points you've made up. So, so, I don't know. Your CM is what? It's what nine now? What? Your Cthulhu mythos score twelve. Twelve. Okay, so your maximum sanity at this point is eighty-eight. Okay, I'm Adjust, at forty. I'm so. just saying your maximum is not one hundred. You anymore. cannot go higher than eighty-eight. You cannot go higher than eighty-eight. Okay. Never again. <laughs> eighty-eight. You know what you never going to see that, that number. <laughs> nope. Uh, nope. Mr. Forsyth, you have 14 months. Tell me what you're doing with it. Um, well, originally I would think that on a multi-year construction like the McCormick Tower, I would be working for 14 months. That's not going to happen. Okay. Too much recent upheaval Mm -hmm. and the um, events of the foundation laying. Sure have unsettled me, and while I would probably work for some months, I would make up a convenient excuse to leave the job early, Hmm. some sort of family issue, and then I would travel for a couple weeks back to visit family in Warren, Ohio, and... Okay. The the colonel obviously... Yeah. um, ...does his, uh, is sad to see you go, hopes you return soon... Yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I'll make uh, the appropriate noises, knowing that I'll never touch this job again. Sure. Um, <laughs> as much as I wanted to, what I got wasn't what I wanted. That's very true. Um, I, like I said, I would go. I would go back home for a couple weeks of vacation, and then I would um, find another job, maybe one a little bit less time-consuming. Okay. And while I do that, I want to start looking into the mystery of this thing with the stones and the colossal men and, mm-hmm. and you know, all these things seem to be pointing somewhere that sure. I haven't been able to figure out and I don't know about, but I've always been interested in that stuff. Okay. So you're going to go into... History, mythology, archaeology. Okay, okay. So you're spending your your most of the balance of your fourteen months in deeper study. Yes. Right. Okay. Great. That gives me a good idea. And then, uh, Doctor, tell me what you spend fourteen months doing. Actually, uh, I'm going to be spending. Uh, Sigmund will be spending fourteen months um, growing his growing his practice a little. Uh, he's not going to hit that really hard because his other th- the something that's kind of been eating away at him. Uh, one. Research. He's going to take a few classes at a local local annex 
so to speak. Uh, okay. you know, I don't know that's not actually how it works back then, but no, it's fine. Um, um, medicine, psychology, sure. You know, um, but he's actually going to uh, more than just studying psychology. Dunning really disturbed him, yeah. so he's actually going to start a campaign to increase either uh, either either increase the conditions at Dunning, like make them better, or yeah. Shut Dunning down altogether you because that draw, play, draw attention, to draw attention problem. to the abysmal conditions there. Okay. So that's, that's kind of his thing is he's gonna he's gonna take on Dunning. Okay. Uh, Miss Fairchild. Fourteen months. It's a long time. Um, it is. I might have them there. <laughs> she is going to try to convince Mary to to move. First of all, find a different home, um, possibly farther out, away from the city. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's going to depend on how Mary reacts. Yeah, I, I think I that she just says that given her position at the university and what she does... She is not the sort of person who's just going to run. It's not in her nature to do so. And so she would rather press the issue and have, you know, whether it be Mr. Doyle or Mr. Forsyth, have somebody shake this guy off when he comes back and tell him that he can go to hell. That's her opinion on it. And she... You probably go back and forth as any anyone in a relationship does, and and especially when it's an issue that's not com- easily resolved. Mm-hmm. You probably have multiple conversations about it, and every time it gets brought up, she just simply digs her heels in more. Okay. So, uh, based on that, Stasi would probably take take some inspiration from that mm-hmm. and say, maybe it is time to stop running. So, based on that, um, they will at some point probably enlist a little bit of help from Mr. Doyle Mm -hmm. and Mr. Forsyth um, and go back to the house after probably stopping at a hardware store (laughs) and start basically fortifying as a matter of just yeah fortifying the house okay and putting things into place that helps them feel more secure. Um, Stasi, never being one to rest on convention, would probably use her pull through some of these, <laughs> some of the sources uh, at the college, excuse me, at the university. Sure. And with her pull through the uh, <clears throat> the newspaper. Uh, get connected to folks who could possibly help her help her learn to defend herself, to build that okay. confidence. You know, boxing or whatever she, you know, maybe some brawling or various, <laughs> you know, very unladylike uh, pursuits. Um, learning firearms, um, at least becoming, you know, somewhat familiar with, with, you know, maybe using that. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Knives and a few other things. You're gonna better yourself in different ways. Better. She's gonna better herself. She's also going to be seeking out her some of her former suffragette mm-hmm. contacts. Um, sure. And probably taking a uh, a few of them. Who were very close to her into a little bit of confidence with some of the information and 
seeing, you know, kind of networking a bit. Um, using, again, those contacts that she has to see what could be found out. Um, first of all, maybe to turn the tables a little bit and have, uh, hey, I can hire a private investigator to find out more information uh, about uh, Herman and maybe turn the tables on him. So she would definitely reach out that's, with that's an interesting thought. to talk to Mr. Doyle and start working with that. She's also wants to find she wants to find out about her mother because her mom gave up everything to save her, and she has not been able to find her since has been too afraid to reach out. So now she is going to request information about her mother. So Mr. Doyle, she will. And Stasi will be giving you some information, former address in Milwaukee, mom's, you know, information. Um, of course, it's been several years, but uh, here's everything I have. Find her, one way or the other, and find him. Hmm. Okay. So, 14 months, Mr. Doyle, finally. Okay. So, first of all, I'm going to have to call back to uh, them and let them know I'm where I'm at. Because I'm going to spend some time in New York looking for Jesse Hughes, since I'm here. Hmm. And then when I get back, I will do everything I can to help uh, Miss Fairchild with her issue, whether it's to find dirt on her ex, her husband, to mm -hmm. blackmail him, or force him to get a divorce, or whatever I have to do. Okay. Then I will find uh, Miss Fairchild's mother, or do a best do my best to do so. Sure. Meanwhile, I will also work on lo try to locate uh, whoever broke into Miss O'Shea's apartment. And I think one of the things I'm going to do, especially if they tell me, uh, I'll look into that police officer, and I'll also go to the uh, tobacco shops to see if I can find that scent. If I can find that scent, maybe I can try to locate who might have bought it. I'd fill him in. Yeah, no, I figured you would. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do before the opening of next game is you'll all get an update card for me. We'll tell you what happened and what resolved in this 14 months. And when we pick the game back up, the next episode, it'll be August 1st, 1924. Okay? All right. All right. One last item of note before we leave. Now, Miss Fairchild did her own exper experimentation with her stone. Is anyone else doing any sort of experimenting with it over the time period or getting to know it more or studying it? Or do you put it in a box and put it on a shelf somewhere? Oh, I'm experimenting with it. I saw what she did with it. Well, uh, I mean, I guess it would kind of depend on whether they tell us, like anybody who doesn't experiment with it, tell us that they, something goes on with it. Yeah. That would be up to yes. the two of them. Because now, if it didn't, I, I, know, I, I know in your... I know in your, and so far what you've told me, your and Stasi's timeline, the two of you talk at least two or three different times. Right. So do you pass that knowledge of what happened with the stone to him, or do you keep it to yourself? No, probably at some point, probably in passing when I'm rooting through my purse or, or my pocket or something, and I pull it out and go, oh. So, and I'll just kind of have it in my hand and you'll notice the difference in it. Have you... Has this happened to yours? No, I just... I don't think so. I just keep it in my pocket all the time. And then I'll relay exactly what I did. Okay. And how much... What happened... What Mr. Forsythe told me. Mm. And so I, I guess I will mess around with so it. So you do. And then the, I know you... I know, Mr. O'Shea, I know you'll be doing something with it. Doctor, are you yeah. doing a sort of scientific test on her? Oh, what? absolutely. Uh, you know, wait, seeing if I can figure out makeup, basic chemistry. Sure. Uh, and then once those divulge any information they can and do, then, I don't know, probably begrudgingly, once I start to hear them, like, experiment with theirs and give it a shot afterwards, feeling kind of foolish to do so, but sure. uh, give it a shot. <laughs> So, what ends up happening over the, the period of time? Um, why don't you all, minus Stasi, of course, make me a power roll? Pow! Pow! Right in the camera. Don't screw I me, dice. I actually made this one. 
Congratulations. Yeah. 29. I got an exact extreme. Extreme? Not hard, but extreme. Can I spend luck on this? The lowest low one? Yeah, the lowest low one. That's extreme, right? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. extreme. Yeah, luck yep. to make it. Okay, so. Can I spend four luck to make it a hard success? Um, you could, but I'll let you know that there wouldn't be any difference. Okay, then. Extreme success on the dice. Yes. Um, extreme. So, what you all find out in your own kind of solitary way is that this stone that you have not only vibrates at a specific frequency, there's a hum to it, as it said before, but after you do some serious concentration and serious looking and studying of it, there is an inner glow to this, and it does have this pervasive, almost positive energy flow that comes off of it. And I say that not in the uh, metaphysical sense, but I say that in the uh, subconscious way that your brain ends up picking it up. When it's in your pocket during the day, you generally feel better. When it's away from you or you forget it for too long or you put it down because you've got to go do something, there is a certain longing for it at some point. It does afford you um, a bit of extra a bit of an extra positive outlook on life. The 14 months that you spend, especially the months that you spend after the stone is activated, are very pleasant. They come with a lot of breakthroughs for many of you, which you'll all find out next session. But you do know in your heart and in your brain now that whatever this stone is, it is not natural. It is not man-made. And it is something you would rather not be without. And I'll drop the curtain there. So we thank you for listening. And uh, we thank you for subscribing and continuing on. Our listeners, we do appreciate it. Shout out to all of our folks in uh, Germany uh, and in the United Kingdom who have been... Uh, we've seen your listener numbers and we do appreciate it. I, I would uh, I'd, I'd like to take a personal note and apologize for murdering your beautiful beautiful language. Uh, I just like to. <laughs> you're we, we're method actors. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.